warm greetings, Amoria Rieger from ETVSNR, which is a US-based not-for-profit organization that provides guidance and research services to educational and cultural heritage organizations. It's a great pleasure today to talk about the increasing prominence of preprints. The COVID-19 pandemic has underscored the importance of speedy sharing of research results. It also raised a range of questions about the role of peer review and long-term sustainability of preprint repositories. In my presentation today, I would like to articulate some opportunities and challenges and encourage that we assume a more nuanced understanding of the implications of such repositories and their evolving business models. Well, what's a preprint? A preprint is a scholarly paper that precedes the peer-reviewed published version. So when a paper, a manuscript is ready to be shared, it is submitted to a preprint server, could be one or more than one preprint servers. And within usual 24 hours, the manuscript the paper becomes available for discovery, use by a range of researchers all around the world. And the same manuscript uh, before or after or during uh, being submitted to the preprint server can also be sent to publishers for peer review. And the value here is that, as uh, you can see from this image, uh, the manuscript becomes immediately available within usually, as I said, 24 hours after it's submitted to the preprint server. Whereas the journal the formal peer review process and uh, being revised and modifications, so on and so forth. So peer-reviewed paper sub papers uh, publication might take months to years. So the goal is really shortening the time from the preparation of the paper to publishing, although obviously peer review is a very important process in between these two points. There are almost uh, 100 preprints out there and uh, almost on every discipline that uh, you can imagine. Archive is often mentioned um, as it is one of the kind of more prominent and probably one of the oldest preprint servers out there. It's 30 years old. It has a little more than 2 million preprint, uh, preprints on it. I actually have had the pleasure of uh, being the program director for Archive for 10 years. It was a great uh, on the ground uh, learning experience. And Archive serves the communities of uh, physics, computer science, mathematics, and some other actual related disciplines. You may see very often the prefix or suffix of XIV in front of other preference servers. So that's why I want to share you that is the source of the prefix. As I mentioned, uh, most of the preprint servers focus on specific disciplinary areas, but during the last few years, we have also seen the emergence of preprint servers that focus on regions or countries. For instance, there is one for Africa. And uh, the goal of this open access repository is uh, to share um, research from the continent to increase visibility of African researchers, and also uh, to provide a platform to really encourage collaboration among scientists too. Although we call them preprint servers, if you were to analyze their content, very often you would find uh, different types of materials. Uh, for instance, there are white papers, literature reviews, book chapters, conference papers, um, very often slide decks or posters. About 50 to 70 percent of the papers submitted are eventually peer reviewed and formally published. So uh, preprint servers also contain materials that never go through peer review or maybe go through peer review and they are not accepted. Uh, let me say a few words about uh, the benefits of preprints. The top benefit of preprint is really increasing the speed of research communication, 
with the hope and goal that there will be some uh, early feedback uh, going to uh, authors to be able to improve their work. Also, preprints are free to read. So uh, there is this kind of open access benefit to it that although published materials may be behind paywall, although this is not peer reviewed, but still uh, for uh, researchers all around the world who do not have access to journals from expensive uh, journals, I should say, from uh, publishers where there is a fee for use, uh, there is the benefit of be having access to an open access version. Well, there are a number of concerns about preference too. And really, uh, uh, if you think about the uh, problems, they it very much depends on who you are as a stakeholder, whether you're an author, even if you're an author, whether you're a senior, junior uh, author or an academic leader, it, your opinions vary about uh, you know, what, are, what are some kind of potential problems about preprint, same thing if you're a reader or if you're a publisher and founder. So there are kind of a range of different angles where we see the concerns coming about preference. I think one area that we hear very often as a potential risk is quality control. As I mentioned earlier, there are about 100 preprint servers out there, but only a handful of them do have a mechanism for quality control. And we are not referring to a peer review process, but being able to review uh, the uh, manuscripts received to just ensure that they're in the scientific papers and that they follow some best practices in means of uh, you know, manuscript preparation guidelines. And actually poor quality research especially becomes um, quite a bit of a concern when it comes to research related to human life and affecting trust in science too. Uh, in means of concerns about preprints, publicly sharing information before peer review is a concern because there's still not a very uh, uh, clear understanding of the difference between a preprint uh, repository and just a journal repository to understand that the materials have not been peer reviewed yet. And therefore, this sometimes may lead to premature media coverage of preprints, which actually was really quite a big of a problem uh, during COVID, which I will get back to this a bit later. Other potential risks, uh, one of them that I wanna highlight, and I may actually go over some of them a bit later, is that information overload. We already are really living in a world where information is coming from all directions. And now, there are also preprints, sometimes multiple versions of the same paper before it's published. And what does it mean, especially for the integrity of scholarly record, when it's sometimes difficult to even identify the changes from a preprint version of a paper and its published version in a journal? Uh, and what are you know what is what are, what are the long term maintenance procedures for these preprints? Are they going to be available ten years from now? 20 years from now, what are the strategies for preserving them? So let me say a few words about uh, preprints during uh, COVID-19. As you can imagine, uh, speedy uh, uh, sharing of information during the pandemic was really extremely important. So preprints started playing a really uh, prominent role. And in April, 2020, there was so much optimism among uh, preprint uh, service providers and uh, folks who really believe in its value that a significant fraction of research was being released as preprints, especially in preprint uh, service, prominent preprint service, such as uh, Chem Archive, focusing on chemistry, Med Archive, with focus on medicine, or BioArchive with biological sciences. But kind of fast forward, um, what became very obvious was that uh, that initial uh, enthusiasm about sharing uh, early findings through uh, preprints, it kind of faded a bit. And by September 2021, 
we started seeing headlines uh, such as this one, no revolution. COVID-19 boosted open access, but preprints are only a fraction of pandemic papers. So uh, obviously still preprints are playing an important role, but there is also uh, much, much appreciation and ongoing commitment to the peer review process, especially when human lives are at stake. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the really challenges of preprints is uh, here being open access and available to everyone in the sense that it's sometimes difficult to uh, understand whether the paper uh, is, has credibility, it has been reviewed, uh, which stage it is at. And uh, we have seen, unfortunately, some of the preprints being used for spreading misinformation because these papers were available as preprints, although they would never pass through the peer review process. And as a really pretty much uh, reaction to this concern, uh, several preprint servers started adding uh, cautionary remarks uh, to their websites. Claimers such as this one that, uh, you know, they, uh, these are preliminary reports, they have not been peer reviewed, and that they should not be regarded as conclusive, especially in guiding cr critical, uh, clinical, practical health-related behavior. Well, how does the future look like? So let me just say a few words about uh, what's happening now. So if you look at it from technical perspective, um, and then, you know, if you kind of look at preprints as repositories, they are here to stay. And we should be prepared to see an increasing uptake. The concept of scholar record is broadening. And there's an increasing emphasis on sharing various outputs from the initial investigation to the final dissemination stage. We want to understand how ideas evolve. The challenge is interconnecting different nodes of the publishing ecosystem. We have preprints, peer-reviewed articles, supporting data and code, comments, amendments. How could these all be discovered and used? Given the trend toward interdisciplinary and multi-institution collaborations, perhaps one of the really big questions is that, uh, how will some of the current individual efforts that focus on specific research communities how will they align eventually to avoid a fragmented preference ecology? Uh, there are not yet proven models to secure the financial stability of preference services. It's complicated to find a way to monetize, monetize preference in order to create a reliable and systematic revenue sources. Um, emerging publisher-led models that integrate preprints into their publishing workflows as early stage research, will also need to address how to fund the additional efforts. Because publishers expanding their activities to the preprint, we do not want these additional expenses end up with additional expenses or additional, I should say, fees put on, uh, on, uh, on research articles published in peer-reviewed journals, which already happen to be quite expensive. Well, if you look at it from a sociocultural infrastructure perspective, which is disciplinary cultures, although we have seen the uh, proliferation of preprints in different disciplines, the science-based fields continue to get more uptake. And perhaps in part for that reason, are they are more subject to scrutiny. You know, we are seeing very often about the credibility, reliability, quality of preference, but mainly really related to domains that are science-based. So what are the opportunities, impediments, and open issues in preprints that focus on social science and humanities disciplines? I think this really is an, um, probably an area that requires more attention, more exploration. One of the virtues of open access is uh, to level the playing field and allow researchers and readers from all around the world to be, to discover, access, and use such literature. 
So on the topic of diversity and inclusivity, uh, there are a couple of observations. Uh, first of all, uh, preprints, as you can see from this image, preprint use varies uh, widely among different countries. And in this image here, what you are seeing um, in kind of darker color is uh, the countries where we are seeing strong authorship and readership coming. And these happen to be the same countries where we are seeing active participation in formal publishing in peer reviewed journals. Uh, United States, United Kingdom, Germany, France, China, Canada, Australia. So unfortunately, although uh, definitely we are seeing contributions from different countries, whether they are users or they are submitters, but still the balance seems to be a bit skewed toward uh, these countries indicated in darker color. The other issue is uh, uh, female participation in preference. And this is just really a snapshot, but uh, this research focuses on January 2019 through April 2020, just to illustrate that at many preprint servers, women are submitting at a lower rate. And we realized that there were some uh, reasons behind this related to pandemic, uh, as uh, several research uh, articles covered the reasons behind this. So we do know that there were some reasons behind underrepresentation, but still this is an ongoing trend where uh, in first author analysis, we are seeing that uh, women are submitting at a lower level. Well, I wanna thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. It's really a great uh, honor to be a part of uh, this wonderful uh, series, speaker series. I want to just mention that uh, for those of you who are interested in reading more about preference, there are two publications, one of them that um, I co-authored about evolving role in science communication. The other one is about uh, preference, especially focusing on uh, developments in means of uh, how they are being published, maintained, and also uh, issues that emerged during COVID um, pandemic. They both are, both of these publications are open access. So I encourage you to look at it if you're interested in it. Again, it has been a great, great pleasure. Thank you for listening. And please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or comments. Stay well, thank you.